Here is chapter 33, <clears throat> uh, Coronary Artery Disease and Acute Coronary Syndrome. This is one of the longest chapters in the cardiac series. However, um, let's try to keep it simple. So this is a disease of the heart itself, particularly the coronary arteries. The culprit here is the same atherosclerosis that uh, caused the problem in hypertension. So our uh, concept is the same. So it is still a perfusion problem. So therefore, this is now a disease of the pump this time. However, you will notice when we do the interventions later, which are geared toward the risk factors or the causes of coronary artery disease. Um, the treatment there, uh, therefore will still be geared toward imp improving perfusion because what will happen is if the coronary artery, so let's say this is a cross section of the coronary artery wherein let's say this is a normal diameter. So in coronary artery disease, the diameter technically didn't change. However, because of a plaque formation, Okay, so this is the original uh, thickness supposed to be. So now the patient has an atheros atherosclerotic pl uh, plaque that formed. Therefore, it narrows the coronary artery, thereby reducing blood flow to the myocardium or the heart muscle itself. And so therefore, it will weaken the heart as a, as a pump because now it has to work with less oxygen um, therefore that will affect contractility of the pump cardiac output suffers perfusion suffers so therefore our interventions will still be about decreasing preload and decreasing afterload all right so let's begin So we'll discuss, we'll follow the textbook, so the learning outcomes. This is my suggestion when you read the chapters. Uh, you, all, you always look at the learning outcomes. What are you trying to learn really in the chapter? So there are seven outcomes here. One is we have to know the pathophysiology. How did this condition occur? Next is the risk factors. We have to look at what led to it so that we can do the next um, phase or the most important is prevention how do you prevent it and since most of the risk factors here are chronic conditions <coughs> i'm sorry uh, chronic conditions meaning on top of the cad itself you have to manage the risk factors that led to it some of the risk factors are chronic conditions themselves namely hypertension and diabetes so this will now be integra integrating all the therapies of um, treating both the risk factors especially the chronic risk factors for CAD as well as there will be acute interventions for CAD um, namely ACS which is acute coronary syndrome and um, so there will be interventions during the acute period and there will also be interventions for for maintenance for the ongoing uh, therapy because um, once the patient has a heart attack that means the heart now is weakened so, so it, they, the patient now requires maintenance medications in order to maintain perfusion maintain cardiac output along with or on top of all the other treatments used to manage the risk factors that led to the heart attack in the first place next is differentiating precipitating factors uh, signs and symptoms our intercollaborative care as well as nursing care intercollaborative meaning with the doctor um, you know, there will be uh, surgical interventions here patient will have to undergo either uh, cardiac catheterization or we call that pci 
and then um, or if the patient can't have a cath uh, cardiac catheterization because there's too many vessels involved then they'll have to have open heart surgery therefore uh, or that's um, by coronary artery bypass graft now instead of simply stenting the one or two coronary arteries um, next is will differentiate um, ACS uh, from particularly uh, chronic stable angina there will be three acute coronary syndromes uh, namely unstable angina non STEMI and STEMI uh, we'll discuss that as we go through the chapter we'll look at the commonly used drug therapy uh, most of them you've already discussed under chapter 32 under hypertension because we have similar uh, cardiac medications with uh, along with new ones as well and most of these antiplatelet drugs because you know it this is used to treat atherosclerosis which led to coronary artery disease in the first place um, these are not exclusive to coronary artery disease this will also be same treatment used um, in other atherosclerotic conditions namely stroke and um, PE as well next is we will discuss briefly the rehabilitation because these patients suffered one of the most life-threatening conditions when they suffer a heart attack and so therefore they will need um, serious rehab programs in order to return to pre-infarct uh, levels although they'll never return to to that level but we will we'll try to <coughs> um, improve their abilities uh, close to pre-infarct uh, levels uh, and then finally for those who are lucky enough to survive a heart attack um, their worries are not over because now they have to contend with the possibility of sudden cardiac death sudden cardiac death is a fancy term for cardiac arrest uh, remember that uh, once tissue dies you cannot resurrect it the the dead tissue heals but it is replaced by scar tissue though just like any other injured part of your body there will be scar tissue formation and remember scar tissue is not functional tissue so the heart will forever have or be in a weakened state <clears throat> and so that will also affect <clears throat> electrical conduction and so these patients are at risk for fatal dysrhythmias namely ventricular fibrillation ventricular tachycardia uh, heart blocks uh, all of which can potentially lead to sudden cardiac death all right let's begin so the overall cause of coronary artery disease which leads to acute coronary syndrome is atherosclerosis as we already discussed in chapter 32 <clears throat> under hypertension so atherosclerosis is the hardening of the arteries all right so let's discuss now the risk factors of why did the coronary art artery <clears throat> how did the coronary arteries narrow all right these are your major risk factors so we have tobacco um, again these are not new we already discussed these under hypertension chapter 32 so we have hyperlipidemia which increases the plaque buildup I'll demonstrate how it builds up here and we have hypertension of course which accompanies it um, exposure to toxins uh, diabetes <clears throat> how did diabetes lead, lead to this so we um, we also describe this under chapter 32 so in diabetes specifically uncontrolled diabetes this will lead to sluggish blood flow um, sluggish blood flow to major organs because think of slurpee okay 
So Slurpee is an uh, all-time American favorite drink. It's very sugary. It's thick. Compare that to normal blood. If you add sugar to your blood at high levels, that will thicken it. So thick blood will have a very hard time circulating, especially to narrow or microscopic vessels. So therefore, if you remember in diabetes in your um, endocrine chapter, that that's why this leads to heart disease, stroke, and then those are the two major macrovascular complications. Then you also discuss microvascular complications, this time involving damage to uh, organs which have tiny blood flow or blood supply um, namely the eyes the kidneys the nephrons and the kidneys then your nerves also and your GI tract and also erectile dysfunction so all of these will um, suffer damage due to decreased blood flow over time as the diabetes remain uncontrolled so it is in that sense that <clears throat> it will lead to atherosclerosis. Uh, Hyperhomocysteinemia. This is a homocysteine is a amino acid commonly found in um, meat. Okay, uh, specifically red meat, um, steaks. Um, what are else are other red red meat? Uh, we have liver. Okay, organ meats are also red. Okay. So if you have a high intake of these amino acids, okay, uh, particularly again red meat, that will increase uh, the chances of plaque buildup. And then finally, infection causing an inflammatory response. So this would be illustrated here. So this is a um, cross section of your artery. Now imagine again for chapter 33 this is referring specifically to coronary arteries however this is an artery so therefore the same atherosclerosis will occur in all other arteries so this can be a cerebral artery this can also be a um, peripheral artery such as the femoral uh, arteries, uh, renal arteries, etc. Okay. So here are your conditions that we just discussed. All of these will cause injury to the endothelium. So they cut the artery here showing exposing the three layers. So the innermost layer is the endothelium or we call that specifically the intima layer. Then we have the <clears throat> the tunica media or the um, middle layer then you have the outer layer which is the uh, external okay so we have intima media externa now um, two conditions here these conditions here can cause direct damage to the endothelium so it will tear the lining because of all these conditions because they weaken the inner wall and if you've already read uh, chapter 37 under vascular uh, disorders, um, particularly DVTs, once there is an injured epithelium or if there is endothelial injury that will now expose the media layer, it will automatically cause the production of tissue factor. And tissue factor, which we'll discuss further under chapter 37, will trigger the clotting cascade. So once there is a tear or injury on your endothelium, there will be tissue factor and then blood clots will start, start forming because the tissue factor will trigger the clotting cascade. And you know how platelets go. Once a platelet is stuck, another, will, another platelet will stick and another and another and the next thing you know there will be a growing clot there now you have a growing clot a thrombus which will now narrow the artery as is illustrated here uh, in this example in uh, illustration b this one <coughs> uh, 
uh, indirectly causes endothelial injury. Uh, I say directly because it will narrow the lumen first. Uh, the plaque, by the way, grows in between. It does not grow on top of the intima layer. So it, the plaque buildup caused by hypercholesterolemia here, hyperlipidemia, um, grows between the intima and the media layers. So it grows and grows. Um, if it's small, this will probably lead to chronic stable angina as long as the plaque size doesn't grow, you know, it remains the same. But as it grows bigger and bigger, um, if you reach uh, more than 70% occlusion now on the artery, then that will now become unstable angina. Um, and then so on. Then you have uh, acute coronary syndrome before you know it. So at this point here, there is no endothelial injury yet. If you don't control, let's say the patient doesn't comply with diet, exercise, or with the medication, so let's say we prescribe statins for this patient. If let's say they, they cannot tolerate the side effects, for instance, or they complain of something else, they stop taking the medication, or they can't afford it. So the plaque will grow, then ev eventually it will weaken the wall. Okay? The, the intima layer wall will now weaken because now, uh, remember, this patient also has hypertension and continues to smoke. Okay, So um, over time, that plaque will rupture. So same thing here, mechanism here. So now you have a damaged endothelium again. So once the plaque ruptures, again, this will expose uh, tissue factor and then another clot will form. So here is your blood clot. Now it, at this point, it will just be a matter of time now um, how much occlusion there will be. So this will now lead to acute coronary syndrome. Uh, it's just uh, the difference will just be made on how long is the ischemia that resulted, whether or not this is a permanent plaque and how much um, cardiac muscle injury was uh, uh, was uh, caused okay so now it will now lead to our acute coronary syndromes namely unstable angina non ST elevation MI and ST elevation MI we'll discuss those in detail uh, shortly <clears throat> So I uh, encourage you to read these. This will explain how they, uh, the figures A, B, C, and D form. So they're discussed further here under the developmental stages. You know how they, how they uh, developed. Collateral circulation. This will grow in chronic episodes. So let's say the patient has chronic stable angina. As long as there is no 100% occlusion yet um, when uh, the body is uh, remarkable if if there is um, decreased blood flow to an area we tend to compensate one of those compensations is angiogenesis meaning if a certain body part in this in this example the, the heart experiences chronic ischemia it will grow new vessels as part of compensation. So this will be one of the signs when let's say this patient undergoes an angiogram and this shows up on the picture that the patient now has developed collateral circulation. So this is uh, the body's effort to maintain perfusion. So through angiogenesis, the body is capable of growing collateral circulation. However, this will only happen in a chronic condition in acute conditions that we illustrated earlier of course collateral circulation does not grow overnight for collateral circulation to grow we're talking months to years here of development okay, the, this thing that don't grow um, collateral circulation don't grow overnight okay so this is just evidence of uh, compensation just like how let's say you learned in copd for instance COPD patients typically present with polycythemia or increased red blood cells. So it's the same compensatory response. 
because patients with COPD have chronic hypoxia, they have chronic hypercarbia. The, the kidney sense that and it will therefore release erythropoietin in order to increase red blood cell production. So that's another example of compensation. Let's go now to the risk factors. I won't discuss each and every one because it will take too long. This recording will end up with two or three hours long. Okay, so the discussion of table 33-1 follows right after it, right here. Okay, so I won't um, read the discussion for you. I'll leave that for you guys. Uh, I'll just briefly describe it. All right, so we divide them into non-modifiable and modifiable risk factors. These, as you can see, uh, if you just glance at it, it's almost exactly the same as those found in chapter 32 in hypertension. So we have non-modifiable age, ethnicity, gender, and genetics or heredity. We have modifiable risk factors. Number one is cholesterol. So we have high bad cholesterol and very low good cholesterol. Please make sure you know these numbers. Okay. Um, hypertension uh, definitely is a risk factor. Uh, along with diabetes, smoking, physical inactivity, which leads to obesity. So these two are always related. The waist size basis here is 40 inches or more in men or 35 inches or more in women. This is waist circumference. You also see these in another risk factor, um, which was mentioned already in diabetes, called metabolic syndrome. If you come across that, I'm sure you, you did. Okay, so I will uh, please read this. This is part of QSIN. This is um, patient-centered care. Okay, and then this uh, in this um, author they call it ethnic and cultural health disparities. So in this order, so whites have the highest, followed by African Americans, Native Americans, and then finally Hispanics. These are major differences here for gender. Women have the highest mortality for cardiac disease. The reason is they typically present with NSTEMI or non-ST elevation MI. And women also tend to present with atypical chest pain, meaning they do not present with the natural chest pain that most men do. So as a result, because they don't feel the chest pain, all they feel is some uh, chest discomfort, which they don't identify as pain. So typically, they won't go seek treatment for that because it, it doesn't feel like a heart attack. Uh, whereas in men, there is typical chest pain. So therefore, they tend to seek help faster or sooner. So therefore, their mortality is much lower compared to women. So like I said already, the table 33-1 is discussed uh, quite extensively here. So from modif non-modifiable to modifiable risk factors. So even without looking at the treatment yet, so you already know what will be the regimen when, when people with have coronary artery disease. So you can bet that one of the medications that they will be put on are statin medications, which we'll discuss um, real shortly. And because they also have a hypertension, so we will add now the hypertensive medications we discussed in chapter 32. We always encourage them to stop smoking. and encourage them to increase physical activity. It doesn't really take much. Brisk walking is the number one recommendation. So walking three to four miles for about 30 minutes, uh, five or more times a week, this is enough to decrease your risk factors, okay? So this will be 
uh, along with diet, of course, uh, can decrease obesity or even prevent it. Uh, diabetes have to be managed. You already discussed diabetes in a separate chapter. Here is metabolic syndrome that I mentioned earlier. This is not diabetes. This is also not technically coronary artery disease yet. But people with, these, with this syndrome, which is a collection of these um, risk factors, meaning central obesity. Central obesity, again, this is a waistline of 40 inches or more uh, in men and 35 inches or more in women. So that's central obesity. Um, hypertension, high cholesterol, and high fasting blood glucose. But they are not technically diabetic yet. So as you can see, metabolic syndrome has risk factors for multiple diseases. Not only are they at risk for diabetes, hypertension, but also for heart disease. Psychologic states. We discussed in chapter 32 that uh, chronic exposure to stress. So this will be people with type A personality, for instance, um, those who uh, emotions like anxiety, hostility, anger, um, lack of social support. So this will be uh, depressed individuals, for instance. All of these trigger the, the, the stress response, right? So this will, these patients will have elevated levels of catecholamines. Catecholamines are your epinephrine and norepinephrine. So as uh, stated here, so stressful states can contribute to CAD because you have a lot of stress hormones. Stress hormones increase your blood sugar. Blood sugar will increase uh, fatty deposits in your because your your body, your liver naturally turns excess blood glucose into fat, and that fat can be stored anywhere in your in your um, belly and also in your blood vessels. Uh, that will include your coronary arteries. And then not to mention the effects of catecholamines, which is um, increased heart rate, vasoconstriction, which increases preload and afterload. Uh, homocysteine, we already discussed. Uh, substance abuse, so particularly stimulants like cocaine and methamphetamines. Uh, so that's... Um, uh, of course, these drugs mimic um, catecholamines. They have the same effects of um, vasoconstriction and also uh, increased heart rate. So these um, these substances will uh, cause increased cardiac workload. Okay, our main uh, goal, of course, is to prevent this in the first place. We always want to promote um, healthy lifestyle, health promotion, identifying uh, high-risk individuals, which we already looked at earlier. The risk factors are uh, including ethnicity. Um, the uh, age, of course, will be middle age, you know, uh, over 40, right, 45, 50 or higher. <clears throat> I think um, the highest would be around 50 or 60 years old so those are, will be your targets um, we educate those individuals or well, let's say uh, middle-aged African Americans for instance could be a good target or a group of uh, Caucasian men in the Midwest for instance okay so since they have a high um, risk factor for not only hypertension but also for heart disease so those are your targets All right, and then these are your teachings, of course. So what do you teach once you identify those high-risk groups? So you teach them to manage hypertension, um, their cholesterol, um, stops tobacco, okay? So, so encourage them always. Don't give up if you get answers like, you know, thank you for asking, but I love to smoke, okay? So, so don't stop, okay? So continue your education. Eventually, uh, people do stop smoking for one reason or another. Encourage, be um, creative with uh, encouraging physical activity. It could be through games, okay? Or, or just um, however you can uh, 
uh, have these patients increase their activity, uh, weight loss, and then finally managing diabetes. Uh, please read these on your own. I already mentioned that the, the level of physical activity should be at least 30 minutes, three to four miles a day, five to five times or more per week. Nutrition, we already discussed the DASH diet. So this is not different from the DASH diet. So same thing, decrease your uh, red meat, um, dairy products, especially whole milk products uh, are high in saturated fat. Here are your recommendations. For diet, um, just be familiar with the sources. Okay, so um, I mean, uh, definitely processed foods like or um, uh, like bacon or um, what is the term? Oh yeah, hydrogenated vegetable oils like trans fat, for instance. So uh, especially snacks or foods that don't spoil easily. You know they have a long shelf life. That means they're either um, high in fat or high in sodium. That's why um, probably you've seen French fries under the back seat of your car from two three years ago. And if you find it, it's still good. You can still eat it. Okay, these things last forever. So we're still on the nursing, okay? We haven't done the pharmacologic interventions yet. So uh, the first half of the chapter deals with a lot of these. So here are uh, practical advice for diet and lifestyle changes. Okay, please read them on your own. All right, so now we have natural. These are not the... Um, pharmacologic yet these are still part of complementary and alternative therapies okay, so we know garlic is good for the heart good for your blood pressure and omega acid niacin although this is um, the natural niacin that they have uh, niacin or vitamin b3 is uh, there is a prescription vitamin uh, b3 niacin which we'll be discussing shortly okay here we are now so pharmacologic treatment for hyperlipidemia, since this is the top, if not the number one, cause of atherosclerosis, so we have different options here. So we have statins, which provide the best cardio protection among all the therapy, although they are harmful to the liver. That's why your nursing responsibility is that. This is a drug chart, so just like in chapter 32, the testable part is column 3 and 4. So you need to know the side effects as well as the nursing responsibilities. What I've learned through nursing school is that if I know the how the drug works, it helps me remember what the side effects are. And therefore, I will also know what to teach the patient, or what to monitor in the patient. For instance, look at statins. So they act on which organ? They act on the liver. So since the liver synthesizes cholesterol, so it will block that function of the liver. And anytime you interfere with an organ's function, therefore you may damage that organ. So that's how I remember it. So we uh, statins, of course, and in statin. So we have atorvastatin, fluvastatin, Lovastatin, pravastatin, simvastatin, and rosuvastatin. Here's niacin or vitamin B3. Um, so here are the side effects. Um, take note that most side effects subside with time. Um, however, uh, it still causes um, decreased liver function. And here is a um, advice in order to decrease the flushing and the pruritus that may occur here's phenofibrate still acts on the liver and uh, take note that this is harmful to the liver plus if you add the statin to it that's why it will increase the um the, the side effects 
here's a natural source omega 3 the only thing here is arthralgia which is not really harmful okay so these are joint pains bile acids this uh this group of drugs particularly cholestyramine or this is uh, prevalite this thing uh, works by binding with bile acids which are fat acids uh, in the intestine so therefore um, they will lower um, intestinal absorption of uh, cholesterol however since th this is their action they bind with bile acids they may interfere with the absorption of other drugs and then remember these patients taking these have hypertension and other heart conditions so they may be taking other medications for that for for their condition chronic condition and taking uh, pre prevalite or cholestyramine may interfere with those absorptions so this is very important um, these drugs are not common so I'm not testing this group Uh, this one is, however, quite common. So we have ezetimib. Um, again, this is very harmful to the liver. So if there's liver impairment, it um, should not be taken. Uh, I think you can say the same also for statins. They discuss these further and they even have drug alerts here. So I may grab drug alert questions here and turn it into a test question okay. these are important and this is life-threatening rhabdomyolysis can cause acute kidney injury and may lead to death so that's for simvastatin uh, especially when you use again i think we mentioned this earlier so with gym fibrocell uh, it will increase the uh, or with the niacin Here's another drug alert for niacin. Okay, please read them. Make sure you pre uh, prepare for test questions on all drug alerts. They are all testable. Okay, part of our, we're still under um, addressing the risk factors. Okay, we, we haven't done the treatment for the acute episode yet. So these are controlling the risk factors. So if the patient already has atherosclerotic plaques because they have you no know, high cholesterol, they're smokers, they're diabetics, hypertensive, etc. So we will do prophylactic treatment now. So we will do antiplatelet therapy because we don't know when that plaque will rupture and will cause a blood clot or a thrombus to form, thereby uh, obstructing or occluding blood flow to the coronary artery uh, which will cause um, the myocardial ischemia so we try to prevent those episodes by putting the patient on antiplatelet therapy we start with aspirin if they haven't had a heart attack yet they may be put on aspirin only after acute coronary syndrome however they will start receiving a second antiplatelet drug which is now Plavix so again we are still we are still in the prevention here controlling the risk factors so most common recommendation is 81 milligrams of aspirin so that's baby aspirin chronic stable angina is not an acute coronary syndrome okay this is not included so when you have advanced coronary artery disease you have a um, you have been diagnosed, you, you did an echo, okay, so the doctor already, um, you already complained of chest pain to the doctor, so you sought um, medical treatment, and during diagnostic testing, so they discovered during an echocardiogram that you have atherosclerotic plaque in one or more coronary artery, arteries, so now you have coronary artery disease. So when that coronary artery disease, the plaque that you have formed in your coronary arteries, now block 70% or more in most coronary arteries, or if it's the left main coronary artery, which is 
the on the left side which will supply the lateral wall as well as the left uh, ventricle of your um, heart uh, it starts at 50 percent or more okay um, why do we have a lower threshold because the left uh, coronary artery is the one supplying the left ventricle uh, particularly when it goes down and becomes the left anterior descending coronary artery the LAD that thing is called the widow maker because not very many people survive an LAD MI when they have that the left left ventricle dies the, most of the time they don't make it if they do um, the heart is severely weakened because again this is the left ventricle we're talking about so if the left ventricle is scarred then these patients will be under class 4 heart disease now or if not class 3 maybe so they'll be severely symptomatic they'll develop heart failure as a result and will be uh, high risk for a sudden cardiac death table 33-6 these are div uh, divided into two columns meaning these are what will cause chest pain, okay? So uh, we have cardiac and non-cardiac causes on the left side, and then we have conditions, again, cardiac and non-cardiac conditions on the right side. Look at the heading. The, the left side talks about decreased oxygen supply, and the right side says increase oxygen demand or consumption. Now let's take it one at a time, that way you don't have to memorize them. Okay, there's really no need to memorize. All you need to know is how do these affect the heart? Or particularly, how does it affect the myocardial oxygen needs? Let's begin with the first column. First column deals with decreased oxygen supply. So if you go down the list, read each one, all of these conditions will lead to decreased oxygen content in the blood. Say for instance, if you have, um, and then we're talking about the coronary artery here, okay, specifically. So if you have atherosclerosis, you have a plaque deposit in one or more coronary arteries. So even if that uh, blood that's running through there is carrying enough oxygen, because it's narrowed now, so it will lead to decreased blood flow to the area, to the myocardium, therefore less oxygen going to the myocardium. Then you can go down the list. So any condition here that either decreases cardiac output, such as what happens in dysrhythmias, heart failure decreases cardiac output. So there is decreased oxygen delivery to the myocardium. Other non-cardiac causes are anemia. You have anemia, so you have low oxygen uh, carrying capacity. You have less red blood cells to carry oxygen. So therefore, that will lead to decreased oxygen supply. Okay, Not only to the myocardium, but for the rest of the body. And the same goes for asthma COPD. Asthma COPD, your oxygen levels in the blood drop, right? So that therefore, all of these conditions will lead to decreased oxygen um, delivery to the myocardium. And then same thing with um, uh, pneumonia. So pneumonia, you have, and dehydration, again, you have decreased blood pressure, you have decreased uh, oxygen in the, in the blood, or decreased oxygen delivery to the myocardium. All right, I hope that was clear enough. Look at the um, conditions in the right side on the second column. All of these conditions result in increased oxygen consumption or oxygen demand now how will there be increased oxygen demand every time you are exerting which the in in uh which results in increased heart rate remember that the the higher the heart rate the higher the patient's myocardial workload if the heart works faster or works harder then it is also consuming more oxygen it will require more oxygen so all of these conditions starting from aortic stenosis down to the stimulant drugs result in increased cardiac workload 
So let's go down the list briefly. Aortic stenosis. So the door um, to the to the aorta, which is you know against which the uh, left ventricle must pump in order to push blood out of the aorta, is closed, <clears throat> meaning it doesn't completely open. So of course that will drop cardiac output. It will result in tachycardia. Cardiomyopathy is in chapter thirty. Uh, in the heart failure chapter, I think that's 34. Yeah, 34. Uh, this is this results in a diseased heart, you know, a very abnormal looking heart. Uh, of course, that will decrease cardiac output, that will trigger tachycardia as a compensatory response, then that will increase oxygen demand. Same thing for dysrhythmias. Dysrhythmias result in low cardiac output. Low cardiac output triggers sympathetic response, increases cardiac uh, contractility, you know, uh, increased heart rate, sorry, and then increases vasoconstriction. So after load is increased, that will increase again cardiac workload. Okay, and then I can go down the list. Anxiety increases heart rate, hypertension, there's high preload, I mean after load, then there will be um, uh, increased cardiac workload. Hyperthermia, same thing, hyperthyroidism, so you have a high metabolic rate, heart rate increases, cardiac workload increases physical exertion blah 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 <clears throat> so again all of these conditions here result in either um, in increased heart rate and or increased cardiac workload all right chronic stable angina again this is not acute coronary syndrome this is chest pain patient develops or feels chest pain, usually it's predictable. What are those um, predictable things about chron chronic stable angina? Um, again, this is due to a stable clot, okay, uh, no, a stable plaque. Okay, so you have an atherosclerotic plaque which is stable. It's not growing. It's the same size. So when um, when you assess the chest pain, it's the same. Same patterns, duration, and intensity. What are the triggers? Usually, it's the increased oxygen demand or increased oxygen consumption and or decreased oxygen supply. So let's take a typical uh, event. Is We just had the winter. When there's snow and you have a middle-aged person with uh, atherosclerotic plaque, a smoker, hypertensive, diabetic, etc. So he shovels snow. Okay, so that activity increases oxygen consumption, correct? That increases oxygen uh, demand by the myocardium. So when he does this, of course, before he did the activity, although there was a atherosclerotic plaque right here so here there will be no chest pain yet because you are not increasing the oxygen demand however when you start exerting so it now is shoveling that's a hard work so it will now increase the heart rate thereby increasing so this is uh, shoveling okay or exercise so we are shoveling so that activity increases the heart rate, increases O2 demand. And because this coronary artery is now narrow to begin with, if you increase it, therefore, all of a sudden, it cannot meet the increased oxygen demand. At rest, this may be enough. Okay, so this narrowed lumen here of the coronary artery may be enough to supply day-to-day -day needs. However, if the the consumption and demand of for oxygen is now increased then definitely because of this plaque right here there will not be enough blood flow to meet the increased demand therefore there is ischemia that results and when there is less oxygen flow to an area uh, of course they will cause pain so these are the triggers physical exertion stress emotional upset which are listed here under the non-cardiac uh, causes of increased oxygen demand or oxygen consumption 
um, pain assessment it's the same as any other pain this is nothing special so every time there is pain whether it's chest pain or wherever you always do a comprehensive pain assessment which is PQRST please review that on your own this is the typical pattern of cardiac related chest pain later when we discuss acute coronary syndrome they are going to present the same way so it's almost impossible to tell them apart that's why when they initially come in the diagnosis is acute coronary syndrome because we cannot tell them apart unless we do certain testing okay again the difference between the three acute, acute coronary syndromes i mean the problem with the, the three acute coronary syndromes is it's almost impossible to tell them apart so unstable angina non-STEMI and STEMI all present the same way okay there's really no oh this type of chest pain that's unstable and that oh this type of chest pain oh that's MI that's non-STEMI oh that type oh that's that's STEMI it's impossible okay so that's why on admission the diagnosis will be acute coronary syndrome until maybe 24 or hours later then we can make the doctor can make a more definitive diagnosis as the cardiac enzymes come out as st uh, and, and t wave changes now occur okay they, they now show then uh, they can make a definite diagnosis and therefore a appropriate treatment um, <clears throat> pain at rest uh, this time though we can say it's unstable angina because unlike chronic stable angina which again um, is predictable okay so we know when it when it comes on so let's say they uh, they go shovel uh, snow or they have sex for instance okay so any physical activity is usually the most common trigger for chest pain so it's predictable um, in unstable angina the pain comes on even at rest and is unusual meaning you're not doing anything you're not you're not on the pot trying to give birth to a big turd okay you're not doing anything you're just resting sitting on a couch watching tv for instance or you did such a very minor activity okay nothing that typically causes um increased oxygen demand or consumption okay so that means the plaque that you have is way worse than a stable plaque uh, a stable plaque so let's say in unstable angina this is probably all that's left in your coronary artery okay that is the only part that is remaining open okay so when we reach that point then that means we already have unstable angina or this thing can come on so let's say um, you have a thrombus or this suddenly um, say you have um, a precipitating event for instance that abruptly closed it but uh, as long as it doesn't last more than 10 minutes then it is still angina okay so here are again your precipitating factors table 33-8 please read them on your own uh, it increases during the holidays <clears throat> because you know what we do during the holidays we splurge on the best tasting foods and the best tasting foods usually involve high fat or high sodium okay. but they're still the best all right for comparing the types of angina because there are <coughs> uh, four we will still only test chronic stable angina and unstable angina we do not test these two okay so we are beginning nurses uh, there's really no need to um, plus your uh, your interventions will be similar anyway okay so all we need to know is the chronic stable one and the unstable one which is part of your acute coronary uh, syndrome so we will skip those okay uh, except this one all right, treatment. So we follow A, B, C, D, E, F. Okay, um, this is a nice acronym to follow. So we have antiplatelets, so this would be aspirin, uh, ACE inhibitors or a ARBs, 
Okay, and the anginal would be nitroglycerin. We'll go into specific drugs shortly. There will be another table for that. Uh, beta blockers or blood pressure control. Uh, stop smoking and calcium channel blockers, cholesterol management, D diet, diabetes, depression screening, E education and exercise, F, uh, F flu vaccination. Uh, flu vaccination because of course if these patients get the flu that will decrease oxygen um, uh, supply uh, therefore will cause uh, chest pain or ischemia here are the specific drugs now table 33-11 so for angina particularly both chronic stable angina and acute coronary syndrome these are your and uh, your drug therapy now this will be discussed on how this will be used on the second half of the chapter which is now under uh, acute management or initial management and then ongoing management okay so aspirin these are the doses doctors decide whether it's two or three no, two or four aspirins, baby aspirins. Uh, although aspirins do come in two forms, we have uh, baby, which is 81, or we have regular aspirin, which is 325. Okay. So just please, I highlighted some differences here because this is just a matter of choice. Antiplatelets uh, besides aspirin are can uh, cangrelor, clopidogrel, prasugrel, and ticagrelor. Uh, you've see, probably seen commercials on TV. Um, there are certain differences here, like this one. Prasugrel is not indicated uh, uh, to treat um, ACS alone, okay? So, meaning they're not affected. Uh, same thing for this drug right here. Vorapaxar must not be used. It's contraindicated in patients with stroke or TIA because of the risk for bleeding. So these are antiplatelets. So it's not like they destroy platelets, okay? Antiplatelet meaning they inhibit platelet aggregation because that's what platelets do. That's how they stop bleeding is because they stick together. So platelet ag aggregation means platelets sticking to each other, okay? So therefore, if you prevent them from sticking to each other, then you don't, uh, you prevent them from forming a clot. Um, we have anticoagulants. This drug, you don't have to study this. Uh, they are not commonly used. Okay. Anticoagulants. Now, these drugs are used during the acute episode when a doc, I mean, a patient is having an acute uh, coronary syndrome. To let's say it's an MI, especially. So, if they have an MI, whether an end STEMI or STEMI MI, we want to keep the, the clot that caused the um, infarction uh, stable okay we don't want it getting bigger so heparin does that so heparin will stop the the further uh, activation of uh, more clots it will discuss how they work in chapter 37 under dvt um, so we have different choices here doctor decides which one he wants to use but most of the time during the acute episode, the patient will be receiving IV heparin, continuous IV heparin. Um, low molecular weight heparin is another option. Uh, the difference between the two is heparin, unfractionated heparin, which is used IV, is uh, has a shorter half-life. So it's best to use if you're planning to do uh, cardiac catheterization because the moment you stop the heparin a couple hours later they're good to go for surgery okay they won't bleed anymore because the heparin is gone it's, again it's very short acting it has a short half-life low molecular weight heparin however has a 12 hour half-life so it's kind of diff di more difficult to to manage okay especially if you have if you're planning a uh, surgical intervention so the patients usually patients will be on unfractionated heparin rather than low molecular weight heparin. Um, LMWH is more for uh, prevention. Okay, um, Let's say you want to prevent um, DBTs for instance. Okay, 
um, or for let's say low risk PEs or low risk uh, blood clots. Uh, vitamin K uh, antagonist, this is warfarin. Again, we'll discuss all these under chapter 37. This direct thrombin inhibitor, uh, as, as opposed to these uh, unfractionated heparin, which is um, uh, indirect, um, direct thrombin inhibitors, this drug specifically is used only during cardiac catheterization. Okay, I've never actually seen it used in any other condition. Okay, so we need that during the uh, PCI itself, the cardiac catheterization procedure. Argatrobin um, is an alternative. We usually use argatrobin if the patient has an allergy to heparin or if they develop heparin-induced thrombocytopenia. So since we can't use heparin, then we'll, this is an, an option. Okay, So it's still an anticoagulant, but we reserve the use only if uh, the patient can't get heparin. Nitrates. So we have different forms of nitrates. These are obviously vasodilators. Um, there are short-acting forms. So this is uh, equivalent to the Saba. Do you remember in COPD and asthma, you had short-acting bronchodilators. So sublingual nitro or the translingual um, nitros, nitroglycerin spray are for short term okay so emergency so just like your sabas these are emergency drugs so they are going to dilate your coronary arteries really fast but they are short acting okay that's why you uh you've read that you take them every five minutes okay because they they are short acting and the other drugs you already know arbs uh, ace inhibitors beta blockers calcium channel blockers let's pause here for a minute calcium channel blockers you have to be careful with these because there are two types we have dhps and non-dhp calcium channel blocker dhp uh, stands for dihydropyridine um, calcium channel blockers sounds like a mouthful but um okay to long story short the calcium channel blockers that end in the peen Okay, like amlodipine, thalodipine, nicardipine, nifedipine. These are DHP calcium channel blockers, meaning they only affect peripheral arteries. Okay, oh no, sorry, only arteries. Okay, uh, whether it coronary arteries or peripheral arteries. All right. The non-DHP ones, there are only two. We have deltaism and Verapamil. These are the only two calcium channel blockers which are non-DHP. These two, on top of the uh, arteries, they also affect the AV nodes. So what the calcium channel blockers, so therefore there are calcium channels in most cells, right? Particularly in cardiac cells. So what they do is, since they prevent calcium from entering because there are calcium channel blockers so therefore there will be no vasoconstriction okay so the the artery because remember vessels arteries are muscles so uh, they need calcium to enter it in order to contract by contracting we mean they constrict so if you prevent calcium influx into the cell by blocking the calcium channels of, on the cell wall then <clears throat> there will be no vasoconstriction and instead you'll have vasodilation so only amlodipine the dipines are dhps meaning they only affect um, arteries non-dhps which are deltaism and verapamil are non-dhps so therefore um, on top of the arteries they also affect the, the pacemaker cells of the heart particularly the SA node and the AB node so therefore the non-DHPs have almost identical effects as beta blockers beta blockers on the other hand because they are beta adrenergic blockers 
So therefore, they inhibit sympathetic nervous, uh, nervous stimulation, which again has two effects, vasoconstriction and increased heart rate. So in that sense, beta blockers and the non-DHP calcium channel blockers are identical. They both reduce heart rate and cause vasoconstriction. I hope that was clear. Opioids, the only one used is morphine. So the purpose of this is to relax the patient, relax the muscles. So therefore, uh, decreases oxygen demand, decreases oxygen consumption. Plus, you know, they need pain uh, relief as well. So it's, it's very useful drug. You probably uh, heard of the acronym MONA. So it's uh, morphine, oxygen, nitro, and aspirin. Okay. Uh, but just a warning, okay, it's not given in that order. Okay, it's not morphine first, oxygen, next, nitro, and then aspirin. Okay, it's not. It's just a nice acronym. What actually happens is either ONAM or OANAM, okay, uh, which kind of sounds weird. So it's uh, oxygen. It really depends on the setting. Where Where is the patient? Okay, are they on at home or are they uh, on the on the on the ambulance? Okay, it really depends because um, chances are how many of us have oxygen at home? We don't. Um, chances are we may have aspirin laying around. Okay, although if your family is young, you probably won't have aspirin. But if there's a old elderly person in the house, usually we have aspirin. Thrombolytic agents is only used if the hospital that you were taken to does not have a cath lab. Then the reperfusion therapy we need is, you know, we, we don't have a cath lab, so we can't stent you. We can't put a stent in the coronary artery. So what we'll do is just dissolve the clot that's causing the MI. All right. So that's the only uh, time we will use the thrombolytics, specifically alteplase. It's only done if, let's say, you decide to have a heart attack in the middle of nowhere. Let's say Route 69 in the, on the way to you know, the, the Midwest. And you're in the middle of the desert, for instance, in Arizona. So the, the closest hospital is just a small community hospital. No, no cath lab, so no cardiologist. So you'll receive a um, thrombolytic instead. Uh, we'll discuss the indications and contraindications of those shortly. All right, please note the um, how you use sublingual nitro. Okay, so we said that um, this is typically taken by chronic stable angina patients. And uh, we said that chronic stable angina is predictable it's uh there are precipitating factors uh, the things that provoke chest pain is physical exertion or a strong emotional um, or, um feeling okay like anger or sadness or happiness all right whatever okay so they typically respond to nitro however if the chest pain is caused by unstable angina Unstable angina does not respond to nitroglycerin. Um, and unstable angina is already part of acute coronary syndrome. So let me do a small modification in this highlighted section here. I know the book here says you take nitro, okay, sublingual, or you spray it. So sublingual, you put the tablet under the tongue. And if it's spray, you spray it on the tongue, okay. And then five five minutes later, if the pain doesn't go away or gets worse after five minutes, I know this says take another nitro, right? And then five minutes later, take another one. However, we know that if the chest pain does not respond to nitro, is it chronic stable angina? It is not. Okay, so therefore, this part here wherein you contact the EMS, when should this be done? Should you call after um, the three nitros are taken? Or do you take it after the first one when it doesn't work? For me, it should be done after the first one, okay, if it doesn't work. Because in the first place, again, it did not work. So are we still dealing with chronic stable angina? 
we are not. The patient is not having a chronic stable angina anymore. The patient is having either unstable angina or worse, it could be non-STEMI or it could be STEMI. Is that clear? Now, you can approach this, you can follow this if we're already in the hospital. Of course, we can't stop uh, and then call, you know, because we're already in the hospital. So instead, you will just call rapid response, okay? Because we're already in the hospital. However, that would be my only take here in the, in the instructions because, again, my point is, if it doesn't respond after one tablet, it is not chronic stable angina. So therefore, you should call right after the first one if it doesn't improve. And then while waiting for the EMS to arrive, you take the second and the third every five minutes. I hope that was clear. Please read the uh, uses here, you know, how you store the tablet how you know whether or not it's still working, okay? Or how it should be, um, the container, you know, it comes in a light resistant brown bottle. Usually it's brown because it's light sensitive. Uh, it They lose potency if exposed to light, okay? Uh, please read, let's say, you know, uh, of course this thing causes uh, a headache because it dilates everything. So it dilates uh, cerebral arteries, so the patient will have increased blood flow to the brain. It will cause a headache. Mm -hmm. All right, and then we have long-acting nitrates. This is done already when the patient's in the hospital. Comes in two forms. We have tablets and we also have uh, ointments. Oh, of course, uh, nitroglycerin also comes in a drip. Okay, also comes IV. All right, so there are instructions on how to use each one. Okay. Um, oh, uh, by the way, uh, we, I mentioned Saba and Laba earlier. So the nitroglycerin here is your um, Saba. Okay, this is your short acting. So you carry this everywhere you go. So when you're having a chest pain, you take this okay, immediately. So make sure you have it with you, just like your rescue inhaler in COPD. Uh, long-acting ones are equivalent to the LABA here. So these are long-acting nitrates, meaning they last uh, eight, six, eight hours okay, at a time. Um, I have something here for the... So here, um, meaning if you're taking the long-acting nitro, uh, doesn't mean you don't need the sublingual or the spray anymore, right? You still need them. Again, it's the difference here. Is, uh, these are LABAs and... Uh, Sublingual nitro is your saba. All right, the ointments. Uh, just like anything that is placed or used long term, the, the body tends to develop a tolerance to it. So since this nitro paste is applied on the skin and covered with a paper uh, that we use to measure the drug. Um, how do I explain this? Okay, um, nitro ointment comes in a tube. It's like a tube of toothpaste or in the hospital it comes in single it's dispensed in single use um, foil packs okay so you will have paper here you will say nitro bid which is the most common brand and this will have this is one inch long you know they will have like this one inch two inches okay so the most common dose is one inch. So what you do is dispense the nitro ointment. You squeeze it onto the paper, one inch long. Now don't squeeze uh, a lot, just like you know you would with toothpaste. It doesn't work like that. So you just squeeze a thin layer, one inch long, okay, on the paper, and then use this paper. Of course, you will be using gloves here because this this will have. It's an ointment, so you get it on your skin. You will have um, vasodilation. Okay, you next thing you know, you're unconscious on the floor uh, because your blood pressure drops. So, of course, you have to wear gloves here. It happened to one of my LPNs uh, at work. Um, she took a shortcut, didn't use um, gloves, and then at midnight, we found her on the floor, diaphoretic. We um, measured her blood pressure it was low below below 80 
Okay, so she passed out because um, and then we when I interviewed her, she said, "Oh yeah, I didn't. I must have touched nitro. She wasn't wearing gloves, so don't make that mistake." So you squeeze uh, one inch long, and then you apply this on the patient's skin. Um, there are rules here. Don't put it on a hairy part. Okay, make sure it's a nice, clean area of skin. Um, what we do is we put it on usually during the day, and then before bedtime, you take it off. Please don't rem don't forget to take it off. Okay, and of course, before you put in a new one just like with any other patch or topical uh, medication you always look for the old one okay so you make sure we remove the old application before putting on a new one uh, besides there shouldn't be one because uh, usually the day people uh, the day shift puts it on and then the night shift people take it off right um, but obviously sometimes we forget and uh, actually I've seen a patient with four of them uh, at one time I can't I, I couldn't believe it all right so here is your drug alert for nitrates okay you please read on your own uh, this is nitroglycerin so this is the same nitroglycerin uh, you use for dynamite okay explosives um, so therefore um, you know don't don't put a defibrillator over it will um, catch fire. Uh, we already know about ACE and ARB, ACEIs and ARBs, beta blockers. Please read them on your own. Calcium channel blockers. I gave you the difference between the this one, the non-DHP and the DHPs. Please take note. Uh, there's a difference between the two. Uh, so therefore, you can see here the um, only the DHP ones are used for hypertension. Uh, Non-DHPs are usually used for uh, ACS and um, also for dysrhythmias. And we use statins and Renexa. So this is a sodium current inhibitor. Okay, diagnostic studies. We already discussed some of this in chapter 31. Uh, cardiac catheterization is both diagnostic and therapeutic. Meaning it's not only used to put a stent, it can also be used to diagnose okay, how bad is the, um, is the CAD, how bad is the um, obstruction or, or occlusion of your coronary arteries. Okay. So here are some pre-procedure nursing responsibilities you know it uses a dye because that's the only way we can see the the angiogram no sense it's an angiogram so therefore uh, it uses a dye okay so it uses a dye and then we take pictures um, and then it'll show the perfusion so if the patient has kidney or, or signs of kidney injury then of course you tell the doctor um, doesn't mean though that we don't carry out the test we have to do the test um, so if they're um, showing signs of kidney injury then we'll, we'll do hydration okay before and after the procedure if there's allergy to the contrast dye depends if it's uh, anaphylactic then we can't uh, if it's um, if it's not anaphylactic then we can do steroids okay And of course, the main use of uh, PCI or cardiac catheterization is to put in a stent. Sometimes they they don't do two. I mean, while they're in there already anyway. So if they see that the usually happens in end STEMI. So let's say the patient's not really having serious chest pain, so we just do a routine cardiac cath. If they see that um, uh, there's a serious blockage they can do the the stenting right there okay, this, they don't have to do you know they don't have to charge the patient twice okay and they're saying uh, oh uh, i want to make more money so you'll have to come back another day and we'll do this again okay that's really not necessary i already mentioned so during pci these are the drugs that we'll use so i mentioned angiomax okay and then after the cardiac cath, since the patient already had acute coronary syndrome most likely, 
and there will be ongoing treatment will be dual antiplatelet meaning two antiplatelets usually aspirin and plavix or aspirin and something else um, please read here because there, there are two stents possibly used here we have bare metal stents and we also have what we call a uh, drug um, where is it there's a um, Oh, here so we can use either bare metal or drug eluding stents the des here um, because the when you put in a stent in the in the coronary artery the the intima you know the intima layer the endothelial layer can grow on top of the stent so it's possible that you could have instant restenosis Okay, so therefore after DES the patient would be must be put on dual antiplatelets okay we don't want any clots forming on that stent so that will be done usually in uh, about 12 months okay, uh, 12 full year so that's PCI if the patient has um, let's say uh, three vessel disease you no know, we can't do the stenting then uh, the patient will have bypass surgery these are the complications that could happen with cardiac catheterization uh, usually bleeding okay? and if not they can't do the stenting then the patient will have to have emergency bypass surgery hey let's go to the other half now which should be much faster because the interventions are similar to what we did in chapter 32 all right acute coronary syndrome so I said there are three we have unstable angina and STEMI and we have STEMI and I mentioned that it's impossible to tell them apart based on clinical symptoms only because again they present with the same chest pain the same radiation the same accompanying signs and symptoms in chronic stable angina you have only chest pain there are no other symptoms uh, that's another difference being there's no nausea vomiting there's no diaphoresis there's no um, numbness <coughs> or chest pressure okay so chronic stable, stable angina, chronic stable angina only has chest pain which was again predictable had um, and it and they re, they they are relieved meaning the pain goes away when you when you either stop the activity or rest or take nitro unstable angina and STEMI and STEMI do not respond to rest or to nitroglycerin okay so this is now what we call it acute coronary syndrome okay because it's difficult to distinguish them apart until we get biomarkers and as you learned in chapter 31 the cardiac enzymes don't come out until about two hours after the injury okay however you will see the EKG changes right away indicating myocardial ischemia or worse myocardial infarction so the first thing we do when they present with the chest pain here when patients first present with chest pain therefore you need an EKG okay in order to tell them apart uh, we will have a, a list of interventions later uh, uh, toward the middle of the chapter on what to do first and they are in order right um, but don't be so we say don't be sarcastic when you answer the question because of course you won't be the only one taking care of his patient this will be a whole team of emergency room personnel okay so don't say don't start saying oh that will take too long no there will be a team of people doing it okay so it's not like uh, between giving oxygen and taking vital signs don't don't think that there's five minutes in between okay there will be seconds in between them all right so while somebody's putting on the ekg electrodes somebody's taking vital signs somebody's starting an iv somebody put oxygen on this patient all right so it's a team effort all right so here are some interesting facts with mi uh, irreversible 
heart damage starts after 20 minutes if there is no collateral circulation again uh, collateral circulation doesn't grow in a matter of minutes okay so collateral circulation only grows if this patient has had this condition for a long time then you have collateral circulation okay um, most of the conditions though most likely uh, especially if they had chronic stable angina first so the we can assume they already have collateral circulation so their chances of surviving might be a little bit higher okay so let's start with ua so as i already mentioned the pain here is not like chronic stable angina anymore so this could be csa that has now advanced okay uh, a chronic stable angina that became unstable obviously so the plaque got worse or the patient developed a new thrombus over it so the pain lasts 10 minutes or more it is again unpredictable okay you, it, you were not doing anything there was no precipitating event um, or very little if any okay very little exertion which normally doesn't provoke uh, or cause chest pain but then it, it does okay so please read the other patterns on your own and i already mentioned that women um, Although women seek uh, attention more than men, however, because of the atypical chest pain that most women present with, they this th that may prevent them from seeking help. Because here, the patient may just feel that these may be their problems instead of chest pain. Okay, so they may just have, you know, all oh, this is probably GI. Okay. So all they'll have probably is fatigue, which is a sign of heart failure. All right, so MI and uh, and STEMI, uh, I mean, MI can be STEMI or non-STEMI. Okay. All right, so based on the difference, no, not, and STEMI is, there is no ST elevation. STEMI, there is ST elevation and or T wave inversion. So here are your possible um, most common sites are either the RCA or left okay or sometimes you'll have the circumflex which is like a lateral wall MI this one is of course uh, left ventricular or anterior wall this one's um, right you can also have a step septal wall MI okay really depends on um, which coronary artery is blocked you can oh well the doctor would be the the cardiologist would be the expert okay on EKG interpretation uh, he can see this for instance um, so imagine there is a uh, triangle let me show this full screen all right so let's say this is our Eindhoven triangle Okay, so this lead one, no, lead one, lead two, lead three. Uh, so this is the patient's chest. Okay, so this is the shoulder right here. Okay, so this is AVR, AVL, AV, no, sorry, AVF. Okay, all right, and then you have um v1 v2 4 5 6 v5 no so three sorry three four five six okay so the doctor will know which mi based on the leads where did he see the he or she see the um st and t wave changes okay um so it corresponds with the lead okay so since three and two are facing this way so two you can see this type of mi here in lead one i uh, know two and three and then if it's on uh, this side here usually it's v1 v2 um this side here of course that's avl um and then three four would be more uh, right here 
um, this area here and then five six will be behind okay so that's just an example uh, that is not testable but don't worry about that uh, plus that's not our job that's the doctor's job all right here are the differences in the the gold standard is we'd like to because of this fact here that irreversible heart damage starts after 20 minutes so therefore our aim to decrease is to decrease the amount of damage to the myocardium meaning we allow it to we allow most of it to recover if we open the artery or we revascularize the artery and therefore the myocardium within 90 minutes of presentation you'll see different ads there every hospital's emergency room will have ads trying to beat each other with um, door to balloon time meaning how long does it take for this hospital this ER specifically to process you the moment you come in to the, to the emergency room until they get the the balloon you, you know they get you back in into the cardiac cath lab and open your artery with a stent okay so the sooner you you do it then the higher your chance of survival this is the gold standard it's cardiac catheterization it remains the gold standard unless of course you get to a hospital which is um you no know, doesn't have a cath lab then you you'll have to contend with thrombolytic therapy that's the only way we can open the artery and um, remove the, the the clot so this is for STEMI and STEMI uh, you can do cardiac cath also you can open the stent wide I mean the or artery larger however thrombolytic therapy is not indicated for end STEMI because STEMI is of course caused by occlusive occlusive thrombus and STEMI is not okay a non-occlusive thrombus therefore it's more harm you cause more harm than good if you give thrombolytics in a non-STEMI okay all right uh, let's not dwell so much about that because these are all doctors um, this part here the, the procedure itself is all uh, doctors meaning that's nice to know right there here are your main responsibilities so to relieve pain so we have morphine of course for that um, we don't want sympathetic nervous system stimulation okay, so that's why we will um, give them beta blockers right uh, because this is harmful to a patient having an MI we don't want this response to continue because again this increases heart rate which increases workload, it increases afterload by causing vasoconstriction. Okay, so these are the other symptoms. So you'll have, uh, that's why there's cool and clammy skin, okay, because of the SNS stimulation. Uh, you have nausea vomiting because this, the pain causing the, um, you know, the, the pain resulting from the MI uh, will stimulate the vomiting center. Plus, of course, your peristalsis slows down because of the sympathetic nervous system uh, stimulation. So that will also add to the nausea vomiting. Fever will result, not high though, just a low-grade fever will result uh, during the one to two days after the MI because of the inflammation. Okay, Because uh, especially if it's an MI, actual MI, so some cardiac cells did die. So therefore, there will be um, inflammation healing process uh, the the length will differ uh, depending on how soon we got to the patient how soon did the patient reach the cath lab uh, in um, the EKG changes um, resolve or starts to go back to baseline within a day or two again if we got to them early if not, then the STT wave changes may become permanent. Um, okay, uh, if you did suffer an MI, uh, of course it will take time for the 
the thing to heal okay so if you had necrosis of the myocardium whichever side of the heart is affected of course it will heal um, 10 to 14 days so two weeks after the event there will be some scar tissue but again this is still weak it's not stable yet so this will explain why your cardiac rehab is in stages meaning we don't have them do strenuous activities during this time because it's not stable yet the scar uh, they could die uh, if you force the the activity on these patients which will be important that's why this will explain later when we do the discharge planning which is your job you need to explain why there are activity limitations okay, during each time because not all patients go to a um, rehab facility okay some of them prefer to go home and prefer to do the rehab at home um, as the uh, the days go by you know beyond two weeks of course the um, parts of the heart are now scar tissue so there will be remodeling it will change the shape of the heart so that's why it, they will also um, be at risk for sudden cardiac death now which will be uh, discussed uh, at the end of the chapter uh, here actually here so uh, complications okay so after you've had an actual MI these are some of the things that will a result the so complications could be fatal dysrhythmias like VTAC V5 or heart blocks um, also these P, uh, these dysrhythmias here particularly PVCs non-sustained VTAC um, are dysrhythmias but if they do not present with symptoms they're usually not treated meaning these are just signs they're not necessarily bad signs okay they can be good signs because that indicates that uh, it, reperfusion has occurred meaning there's in uh, there's blood flow has been restored to the myocardium okay so these are just irri irritations of the ventricles okay uh, but again if, as long as they're not serious meaning they don't produce symptoms by um, asymptomatic I mean the vital signs are within normal heart rates within normal meaning your cardiac output is normal then they're not necessarily treated heart failure is chapter 34 we'll discuss this next this is a condition rather than a disease meaning this will be a state you know a, a state of failure Meaning after the MI, your heart, especially if it has a remodel, okay, change shape right here, hypertrophied or dilated, then it's no longer effective as a AC pump. So these patients will be permanently in this condition, in this state. So they will require maintenance drugs, maintenance therapies, both pharmacologic and non-pharmacologic. I told you last week uh, the acronym DOABLES, okay. Um, this will be part of their therapy for life cardiogenic shock is discussed in chapter 30 uh, 66 this is a state again so just like heart failure this is a state technically if the patient dies from a heart attack from an mi the technical cause of death is really cardiogenic shock so this is shock meaning there is zero cardiac output blood pressure drops below 70 okay in the 60s um so this is just a state of no oxygen okay so this is a state when oxygen and nutrients are inadequate okay so this is um, the actual cause of death uh, when somebody dies from a heart attack another complication is papillary muscle dysfunction or rupture this is the the muscles the connective tissues that hold the uh, mitral valve open and close okay uh, meaning these are what's keeping your mitral valve from um open or or um uh from falling back into the right uh, left atrium okay so these are the muscles that hold them they can rupture and of course if they rupture then the um 
the mitral valve won't close anymore they will remain permanently open and you can just imagine the the, the consequences when that happens a patient will result in heart failure uh, aneurysm is rare but this can happen so aneurysm is a bulging of an arterial wall however this is the vent left ventricle here that bulges okay. it thins out and then bulges and that can be uh, danger for a rupture and because it's now dilated it will tend to pull blood because now it's thin and dilated so it can't contract very well so blood tends to pull in the left ventricle causing clots to form uh, these are nice to know uh, the ventricle uh, ventricular septal wall you know the wall between the left and right ventricle is good uh, rupture uh, pericarditis and Dressler syndrome these are actually similar um, pericarditis it is, is discussed in chapter 36 I believe yeah it should be 36 uh, same thing with Dressler syndrome Meaning both are pericarditis. So as you can see here, Dressler syndrome is pericarditis. So pericarditis is inflammation of the of the sac surrounding the heart. So this can result from an MI because there's inflammation around dead tissue uh, after an MI. So this can inflame the pericardium, uh, causing pericarditis. Again, we'll discuss this extensively in chapter 36. Okay, we mentioned that to diagnose ACS, we need an EKG, and then we need cardiac enzymes. Now, we learned in chapter 31 that the cardiac enzymes are troponins T and I, and they start rising around two hours after the infarct, after the injury, um, and then we'll continue rising, okay? Uh, but first tool here is the EKG, okay, so this is what we need everything will be done in a series meaning one EKG won't be enough okay, so we will do EKGs every few hours uh, of course the patient will be on a cardiac monitor continuous monitor but EKG is uh, 12 leads okay so this is 12 pictures so this is done every six hours um, cardiac biomarkers so we already talked about this in chapter 31 so here is your CK this is troponin. I oh, know, sorry, the purple one is myoglobin. Myoglobin is not cardiac specific. Um, this is also produced by injured skeletal muscles, so it's not very reliable. So we want troponin and CKMB. And as already noted, so your CKMB based on this diagram, so it peaks around um, uh, almost 20 hours and drops around up to 36 hours so about 24 to 36 hours troponin however uh, don't expect this to drop anytime soon so these are hours okay so therefore this thing doesn't drop it peaks around 24 you know, 20 24 hours and then it doesn't drop until look two weeks later okay so 10 to two weeks later your troponin will still be there Right? So don't expect this to drop. As I already mentioned, these are done in a series because we need to know when it peaks. Okay. We discuss angiogram already. Again, this will be the uh, done in the cath lab. Okay. Um, they might do it for diagnostic and or therapeutic purposes so this is the emergency management I talked about mentioned earlier okay so this is the order by which you do it A patient comes in with chest pain we don't know what it is yet so the diagnosis is acute coronary syndrome so these are your interventions so ABC as usual oxygen uh, assess heart lung sounds um, to, to determine heart failure and then we put on EKG start two lines says chest pain so there's no hours in between these okay so this probably is all done within the first one to two minutes okay and here are your drugs um, depending on which hospital is this does the hospital have a cath lab or not so we can decide 
So that will determine whether they can go to PCI or receive thrombolytic therapy. So aspirin, uh, high dose statin is given, and antidiuretic drugs if they have this weakness. And then these are initial, then ongoing. So after the first uh, three, six hours, this will be ongoing. These are what you do moving forward during the patient's hospital stay because any, any, anything can happen going forward. Uh, keep in mind the complications that will result, um, this witness specifically. Um, okay, I already mentioned this, so we give aspirin and then we start heparin again to uh, keep the clot uh, stable. We don't want that blood clot which caused it to be to become worse. Then we take the patient to the cath lab. Our responsibilities here will be pre and post. Okay. Um, again, cath lab will be done if the patient, uh, we already discussed this in the first half of the chapter, uh, thrombolytic therapy. There are contraindications for this thing. Again, this is only done if the patient for, for any reason can't have a cardiac, cardiac cath or if there's no cath lab in the hospital. So these are the absolute and relative contraindications. Absolute meaning under no circumstances can they receive thrombolytic therapy if any of these are present. A relative doctor's call. Doctor can weigh the risks and benefits because the problem with thrombolytic therapy is it's a thrombolytic it will dissolve any clot it won't choose to just dissolve the clot in the coronary arteries so if the patient has any clot at all anywhere in the body they will all be dissolved so that's why this would explain why they won't have they won't they can't have it if they had the intracranial surgery within the last two months or if they had recent bleeding or recent surgery all right so this is now nice to know procedure but again the testable part here is your pre and post-op nursing care that's your main responsibility that's the testable part so we have here um, signs of bleeding if the patient receives thrombolytics please read that all right for if let's say the patient can't have PCI or it's much worse than we thought so they'll have to have uh, bypass surgery so the most commonly used vessel is the internal mammary it's easier because it arises right from here so they just take this out of the breast put it onto the coronary artery so that's easiest if that's not available then you'll have to use the saphenous vein. So this will be harvested uh, from the leg veins. Uh, the procedure is now endoscopic, meaning you'll have just have two small incisions in the thigh, one on the inner thigh, and then another on above the ankle. Okay, just two small incisions, and then they can harvest the vein. Unlike uh, two decades ago wherein our patients had really long leg incisions because because endoscopic vein harvesting wasn't available yet um, okay let's do uh, there are uh, advanced procedures now we have mid cap or minimally invasive direct coronary artery bypass this this one we don't need to open the pre patient's chest for this Okay, these are um, not it's very small incisions okay? uh, almost like doing um, chest tube insertion okay so this is using um, uh, small instruments okay just like they do any other laparoscopic procedure um, these other procedures are actually including mid cab are all um, nice to know Again, our responsibilities is before and especially after the procedure. So after the procedure, these are your, uh, no, uh, during during the procedure, before and after, these are included. We already discussed IV nitro. Oh no, not yet. Okay, so IV nitro will be given 
uh, for MIs. Uh, the reason is we can't keep giving sublingual or nitro uh, spray. Okay, of course they need long-acting vasodilation here, so that's why we use a nitroglycerin drip. We give morph morphine, uh, beta blockers. Um, uh, some of these are repetitious. Uh, stool softeners are on board because we don't want them doing vesovagal uh, maneuvers. We can't have them bearing down because that will cause bradycardia. Uh, vasovagal, uh, vagal, yeah, vagal stimulation. You want to prevent that. Uh, patients and PO, duh, they, they're going to surgery. Okay, <clears throat> so the patient is now uh, post-op. So now we uh, make sure we monitor them for recovery and for complications. Okay. <clears throat> so we continue to do pain management, monitoring uh, activities will be controlled. Again, the scar tissue isn't very stable yet, so no drastic. Um, this is nice to know. So the activity level here will be uh, gradual. Um, uh, these are nice to know the psychosocial of course this is a life changing event it's scary for the patient um, it's a major uh, life event oh um, delegation okay. please review this um, especially pre and post op what can be done by which staff so questions typically is which um, action can be delegated to an LPN or to a uh, unlicensed assisted personnel please read what can be done okay I'll leave you responsible for that all right immediate post-op because the patient especially if they had open heart surgery uh, or mid cab, whatever. If it's a bypass graft, there will be chest tubes in the patient. You discuss chest tubes in lab already. Make sure they are draining properly. The care of the incision. Oh, um, for if it's a PCI, by the way, your monitoring, of course, will be the same. The only difference is, of course, the the uh, access site for the catheterization um, we still do femoral but it's becoming rare nowadays the entry site is now the radial artery which is easier so it's um, less complications now um, major thing is uh, always bleeding okay so you monitor the site for bleeding if it's femoral typically we put them it varies now by institution. Uh, we put them on bed rest anywhere from two to four hours. It used to be six to eight hours, but they discovered that the longer you put them on bed rest, then the more the complications, you know, DVT, um, PE, and um, pressure ulcers. So they've cut down on the post-op um, activity restrictions for PCI. All right, for the incision care so patient has bypass surgery the chest incision is only closed by dermabond and they're left open to air so no so basically there's no incision care to talk about here and with the leg incisions if the saphenous vein was used they're again very small probably two two inch incisions uh, okay, on the upper inner uh, in the inner thigh and also above the ankle on the medial side uh, We prevent complications because these patients will be bed bound so we don't want them um, to develop uh, DBTs so DBTs will and prevention and treatment will be discussed in chapter 37 Now let's go to discharging the patient now. 
okay here teaching so we're ready to send the patient off they need to be reassured that they're okay uh, they need to understand what their risk factors are so they need to um, manage the hypertension everything we listed earlier in table 33-1 okay so management of all those risk factors uh, here's a summary table 33-17 these are what you teach them about their condition uh, very important is this okay so because these are 50 60 years old uh, patients so the, or even younger Okay, so they need to know when they can resume activity. When can they go back to work? When can they have sex again? Okay, so these are important details that they should understand. Uh, just eyeball this. I really don't test this uh, in particular, um, but you need to 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 know what the activities entail. So typically, we have them resume sex if they have they can tolerate moderate energy activities now okay um, of course they can expect to return to you know um, sexual activity that is you know higher than they did before the heart attack of course this will mean they have to do uh, they can't do that at the same level anymore so uh, if they can climb a flight of stairs that's already moderate so if they can do that it's probably safe to resume sexual activity already although some doctors say a period you know after uh, this many days or this many weeks they can resume but that's not always true to everybody it's really their activity tolerance which is the basis all right all right here it is so resumption of sexual activity the reason why i focus on this is if they can resume this then Possibly they can already um, resume other activities, okay? Because uh, sexual activity is quite um, strenuous. So here is your rule, okay? So uh, on top of again, it's not usually based on time. So for most middle-aged men and women, if they can climb two flights of stairs, then that's good. They can probably resume. The rule, though, is probably um uh, have to be modified okay so as um mentioned here for instance okay so some rules for safety is you, it's probably not a good idea to do it um after a meal okay because uh, eating uh, a meal uh, is uh, a lot of energy in itself meaning digesting that food is already a lot of strain on the heart uh, so you don't want to add sexual activity to that. Um, still about sexual activity with um, nitrates. If they're taking short-acting or long-acting nitrates in any form, no. Okay, They can't use Viagra or Cialis. Probably heard it on commercials. Uh, don't take Viagra if you, have, if you use nitrates for chest pain as it may cause a sudden drop in blood pressure. Okay. Uh, definitely no anal intercourse uh, all other activities let's say masturbation uh, oral sex these are okay i mean they're 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 fine uh, or if you're worried you can even use nitro okay you can do sublingual nitro before the activity that way um no if you're still having the angina uh, then you can lessen the activity plus you can you know the sexual activity goes on uh what is this uninterrupted okay all right i already mentioned about the prophylactic prophylactic nitro okay uh, again this is probably not the best advice it's i would still go with the uh, two weeks i mean if they can climb two flights of stairs okay that's that's the best basis for me all right sudden cardiac death to manage this uh, this is uh, basically um, cardiac arrest okay so the patient um, after an MI is at risk for these fatal dysrhythmias here particularly VTAC and VFib um, 
because of the scar tissue that formed after the MI. So electrical conduction isn't normal anymore. So the patient may throw these dysrhythmias. So to lessen the um, the degree of death, you know, the, the chances of death, patients may be advised to have an ICD put in. So here it is. Uh, if, so if they have a high risk of those fatal dysrhythmias um, and cause sudden cardiac death, they will have an ICD. There's a bridge between it, bridge meaning a temporary ICD called Life Vest. This is a brand. This is like, it looks like a bulletproof vest. It's usually white. Uh, there is a black one. So they wear it with no uh, clothes inside typically. So they, they wear it underneath their clothes. So this thing contains electrodes and wires. And there's a battery in the back of the vest. So this will be, think of it as an external ICD. So this will be a defibrillator um, in case they, they throw a, bit, uh, a dysrhythmia, not a BFib or VTAC at any time. So it will automatically, uh, it, it's like an external ICD until they get an internal ICD surgically implanted. And that's it. Uh, you can text or call me for any questions.